Hello there, thanks for stopping by. My name is Mr B from mytopicbox.co.uk and welcome to this explanation for the items in your World War II box which your school has hired. Um, I'm going to go through the items one by one in a second. It's a little bit different than my other videos. Uh, a lot of my artifact box videos have a fact file where I'm going to give you loads of information about the item but this one is much more personal as this is based on four characters in a family, a mum, a dad and a boy and a girl that I found on some photos in an antique box in a um, antique shop and I've using my knowledge of World War II and the way that people lived I've come up with uh, some stories and bought these items to represent the sort of lives those people would have lived so in other words they're what you would call a typical World War II family and I'm just going to introduce you to them now okay so they are here so you won't be able to see these little pictures on the screen but don't worry about it because there are some in this box here which I'll show you in a moment so we've got um, a mum and dad, there's a mum and dad and a little girl, a dad and a boy, and there's the four of them together. So like I say, you can have a look at these um, later in this box. And because they are a family that I've came up with the stories for, um, you're welcome to come up with your own stories as well. See if you can find out anything else about the family from the little clues I've put in the box. Uh, okay, so without further ado, we're going to get started. We get started over here first of all. So the story that I created for the father was that he was a member of a, an organisation called the Home Guard. And the Home Guard were volunteer soldiers that protected Britain, or were supposed to protect Britain in case uh, if we ever, was ever to get invaded. Luckily it never happened, um, but they did a lot of essential work such as uh, making sure that people were safe with things like roadblocks, if there was bombs and things like this, that had, uh, you know, unexploded bombs or anything like that that would block roads. They would make sure that if anybody crashed a plane, any Germans crashed a plane, they were taken prisoner and kept safe as well and, and they were kept safe from the public and things like this. And they um, did all sorts of things, like I say, just to protect the public. And one of the roles they did have was helping something called the Observer Corps, which is a group of men and women who looked for planes and bomber planes and things like that uh, to, to do their job. So the character is one of the Observer Corps. Now in your box you will also get some plane spotting charts and some certificates that this man um, got in the war and you can have a game of that where you can look and see if you can identify some of the planes while your friend holds up a chart at the back of the classroom so that's a nice little one for you so they are royal observer binoculars that's our first one number one i meant to say teachers if you of course if you do want to hand anything around you're quite welcome that's the whole idea of this artifact based teaching approach okay so on to item number two and it's these like mystery tins if you like um, these mystery tins i've created them to give you an idea of the different uh, what we call the facets of characters that's the small things of different characters that everybody has that tells you something about their life like i say it's up to you to interpret them and see what you come up with this is the first one uh, this is a tobacco tin now at the time a lot of people smoked a lot more than today um, so it was quite common to have tobacco tins and this is something that's been shot up at German planes. This is uh, called shrapnel, and it's these I've shot up these huge bombs at the planes, um, and then they would come down. But the thing is, boys, mostly boys, but some girls as well, would collect this shrapnel and they would swap it in the playground and things like this. So this is shrapnel. Um, now it's up to you. I'm going to let you think for a minute. Who you think? That this belonged to. So we've got the dad there who worked in the Observer Corps for the Home Guard. Uh, he's not really involved in shooting guns up or anything. Uh, we've got the boy, I've not explained yet. The boy is into collecting things, there's a bit of a clue. Uh, the girl is into collecting things, but maybe not so much as the boy. And the mum, I think she's just had enough of war. She is actually an air raid ward, and we're going to come to mums in a bit, but I don't really think she's the sort of person who'd collect it. So I'm going to give you a little five seconds to think about who you think this box might have belonged to and then I'm going to reveal it, okay? So I'm gonna count down on my fingers, here we go. So you can have a discussion amongst yourselves. Who do you think this belonged to? The mum, the dad, uh, the boy, or the girl? Here we go, five, four, three, two, one. So in my story, I've got this box belonging to the boy, of course. The boys were mad on collecting things like this and swapping it in the schoolyard and things like that. Okay, hope you enjoyed that game. Let's go on to the next one. So this one here is an interesting one. It's a bit of a double reveal this because you see the object, but then you can unscrew it as well. And here's a bit of a clue. In the past when I opened it, there would have been stuff pouring out of here. There would have actually been oil pouring out of this because this, and you can, when you get it, this is why we use artifacts in here, learning about history. 
you can actually smell it as well it smells a bit oily um, so this was used um, by a person who carried a gun uh, you might not have wanted to carry a gun uh, but it was a way to keep your gun clean it's called a rifle oiler and this fitted in the bottom of the the rifle butt at the back the wooden like rifle butt and then you could take it out and clean your gun which of course was very very important so I think it's pretty obvious who this one belonged to uh, but I'm going to give you five seconds again have a little think now maybe discuss it with the person next to you who you think this rifle oiler belonged to out of the four characters from our story the dad the mum the boy or the girl are you ready here we go five four three two one it is of course the dad yeah because he was a home guard soldier I think that's probably the easiest one okay now the next one we've got is I'm not sure if I'm doing these in order here um, so yeah this is number four so this is an oxo tin you can see oxo was a, a very a favorite beefy drink you could have it it was really inexpensive you could buy it and you could crumble it into uh, water it had beef extract in it and you can get yourself a, a drink out of it. it's a bit like the gravy nowadays you get uh, this is a tin with six tiny cubes it's quite interesting this because modern cubes or oxo cubes won't fit in they're a little tiny bit bigger but I suppose it's because of the war everything was rationed and shared out um, so what we've got in here is some pennies so these pennies here belonged of course to somebody in world war ii now like i say um they might be a slightly different amount in the box you get you will have an oxo tin but it might be a slightly different amount so i'm going to let you count how much they're worth it might be interesting for you to look into how world war ii money works i'll give you a little bit of a clue there was 240 pennies in a pound so how many pennies in today's pound do you know see if you can compare it i'll let the teacher maybe ask you that one see who, see who knows how many pennies in today's pound and there was 240 in them days they was made up of 20 things called shillings and in each shilling there was 12 pennies so 20 times 12 is 240 i'll let you count how much money is in there it might be interesting for you to look up the dates as well so that you can see what happened in that year maybe you could look it up and see what happened in 1944 or 1941 or something like that so there you go a little tin of money who do you think this belonged to was it the boy in our story the girl uh, the mum or the dad well, we've already had the the, the dad haven't we? we've already had the boy so it only leaves the mum or the girl so uh who do you think this belongs to are you ready five four three two one zero did you guess right it's a tricky one this this could be either the mum or the girl uh, you'll see because the next box is also something that a mum or a girl might have i'm going to say that this belonged to the girl i don't think the mum would be saving pennies in a little box like that um, she'd be wanting to sort of save a little bit more for food and things like this in rationing instead of just the odd penny so i'm, I'm going to say the girl but it could equally have belonged to the to the mum as well but it might sort of give you more information when i get the next one out okay so the next one here is this pastels tin and in here this is quite interesting we've got a range of little tiny buttons i don't know if you can see it on the camera i might have to put a picture up we've got little tiny buttons and little tiny ribbons which a big part of world war ii was called make and mend make do and mend because you had to um the clothing was on ration you had to share the food share the clothes out as well as food so you had to make sure that you um you kept little bits like this and you repaired your clothes and so instead of buying you know like us nowadays we might sort of uh, damage a pair of shoes or something like that and just go and buy, and buy another pair in those days you'd have to repair them you have to take them somewhere to repair or do it yourself and a pair of shoes might have lasted 10 years so it was a case of looking after your, your things and clothes of course as well so you might keep little bits of ribbons um, and you might you know repair clothes with them or try to make clothes as well and there's no point in you guessing this one because i've just said that's the girl so i'm going to say that this one is, is the mum but like i say it could have belonged to the girl as well uh, and i've got mum's hobby down as maybe somebody who does this who makes clothes who repairs them who's trying to save up uh, enough of her clothing ration to make some clothes that's the idea with that one okay so the next one we're going to i don't know if we're doing these in order actually yes number six so this is the blackout lamp we're going away from the mystery objects now uh, and by the way teachers like i say pause this video at any time if you want to make sure that people can have a proper look at them you might want to do it with this one because it's really interesting unfortunately it doesn't work anymore because you can't get batteries that fit them it's a very big square battery like this but this tells us just like all the other objects about what life was really like in world war ii if you was living in really difficult conditions in the dark at night 
uh, when the Germans uh, would um, try to bomb you. So if the, the Germans are trying to bomb you, you have to make sure your lights are off, don't you? Now th this came not so much from little lights like this, but the big problem was if you had your light on in your house, of course, if all the streets lit, lit, lit up and street lights on as well, from the above in the air, the Germans could see it like a road map. And if you don't believe me, have a look at modern pictures. See if you can Google modern pictures of the world, the big cities in the world at night, and you will be able to see all the ma all the road maps out a little bit like Google Maps. So you can see exactly where you're going. So say for example, if there was a big factory at the end of a long curving road, the Germans could fly to Manchester or Liverpool or London, and they could look at the map and they'd be able to match that up so it's literally just like looking at google maps so everything had to be blacked out so from half an hour before it got dark at night half an hour before it got light in the morning everything had to be completely black including your windows including your car headlights everything so this has got a blackout feature right at the top there like i say your torch might be slightly different the one here but they all have the same feature basically the top of it is blacked out so that only the light shows from the bottom in my story this belongs uh, to the mum. The mum has got a blackout lamp because she's an ARP ward and an air raid ward and we're going to come to that in a second because I do have some more things that might have belonged to her. Okay now as well as being just a regular air raid warden uh, she was also a fire guard. Now fire guards wear these armbands and these are really nice things. Now you can put this on again teachers if you want to pause it and pass it around the class have a picture took with it. It basically goes like this and easy way to get it to fit children is to give it a twist and if you tuck it in it should fit anybody there. So maybe you can have your picture taken with this. See if you can guess what a fire guard did in something called the blitz when all the bombs were falling. Okay I'll see if you can maybe have a word with the person next to you. Again teachers if you want to pause it now and just do that you can do. Um, and then I'll reveal it in a second. Okay there we go. So whether you've discussed it or not, maybe you've just got the idea in your head, I'll tell you exactly what it was. So a fire guard was an air raid warden specially designated to put out fires, or in particular fire bombs, and these were called incendiary bombs. They were long bombs like this, uh, and they were designed to just, as soon as they hit the ground, just set fire. They had a spring inside it that would set it off. It had something called thermite in it. Uh, and thermite burns really really hot it also had metal on the outside called magnesium that burns really bright so the whole idea was to drop the bombs before the main bombers came sounds horrible really doesn't it but this really did happen to drop the bombs early on in the evening when they met before the main bombers came maybe to mark out a factory or something like that and uh, and then it would uh, the bombers would come along and they would see all the lights and they would be able to drop the proper bombs there but sometimes the proper bombs uh, weren't even needed because they burnt so hot at 1800 degrees which by the way is 60 times hotter than the hottest summer day we get in this country about 30 degrees you know that's sort of one or two hot days we get in the summer imagine 60 times hotter than that it would melt the metal it was so horrific when these went off that they were responsible for some horrible things they in in may in 1941 one of them fell on or some of them fell on a ship called the malacand in liverpool and it completely exploded it had uh, tons of tons and tons of explosives underneath its decks and it exploded and they found parts of that all over liverpool uh, and it was just a horrible thing so the fire bombs were terrible things so what they would do the fire guards is they would go in teams of two sometimes three but more often than not teams of two and they would go use something called a stirrup pump which is a big pump that you put the bottom in the bucket and you pump it like this it's got a little ball inside at the bottom and the ball falls into like a little tiny bowl and basically what you do as you suck it up it's a bit like sucking a straw at mcdonald's as you suck it up the ball is lifted up the water comes into the tube but when you push back down again the ball goes into the bowl and the only way the water can get back out is through the tube through the hose pipe basically so that's what you can do now i use some of these in my school workshops and these are really really powerful things and they still work after 75 years that's how good they are how, how well they were made it's literally just got one working part in it one moving part so but imagine it's okay me saying that and how well they worked but imagine if you was doing it and your whole building was on fire how scary that was and they had to have special training as well about uh, lying on the floor to make sure the heat didn't get get you from above and the smoke um, about making sure you use the right kind of water if the water was too filthy too dirty it would block the pump so there's all sorts of stuff like that and the reason it's a it's a woman who's doing this is because in the war um, a lot of the men were away fighting of course and the women were 
by far the best fire guards because they were um, a, lot of, a lot of the time they were the only ones left to do the job it's a really scary job uh, now we've also got this this is a like i said not sure if i'm doing them in the right order here but you teach you can see which one this is this is a gorgeous little item this and there's a lot of these about for some strange reason but this is um a badge you get a silver arp badge and this really tells us about the woman's life because arp stands for air raid precaution which means looking after you in an air raid when the bombs are falling and i love this badge it's a beautiful little thing it's made of silver and you got this for six months service in the in the war as an arp warden here's the weird thing though some people got these before the war started now if that sounds a little strange to you, let me just explain a little bit more. The reason they got them before the war started was because we actually started the ARP service in 1935, four years before the war started. And it's something I'm very proud of with our World War II British history, that we, a lot of people think that we were taken by surprise by Hitler, but it's not true at all. We were actually ready to fight him and uh, they were ready to defend the country, the ARP wardens. Um, so there you go, so it's a silver long service badge. I'm going to carry on going around. We're going to come back to this big thing at 10 in a minute. I think you'll like that one. Now, this is an ARP whistle here, and I'm going to give it a little blow. Now, you can blow it in class. <whistles> and it is quite loud. And you can see it's got ARP on the side. Again, it stands for air raid precaution. Here's the weird thing about ARP. Anything you do uh, in the war to protect yourself from an air raid is considered air raid precaution. You don't have to be in the organisation. So, for example, just when I click my fingers now, I want you to put your hands on your head and tuck down like this as if there's an air raid. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Okay, so pretend there's an air raid now when I click them again. Stay there, stay there. I want you to take your hands off again. Okay, so you've just been through an air raid there and you've just took an air raid precaution because precaution is something you do to look after yourself in an air raid. Get the idea? Um, so this one, you would have heard this if you know people had to get in a shelter quick and they had to get your attention. Think about a referee at a football match. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Um, this is a King George the Sixth tin. King George was the king at the time. This is his family here. This in World War Two. It's bursting out actually. The contents are really full. Um, king George the Sixth, and this is his daughter. This is his family, of course. That's the Queen. Uh, this is called this lady called Princess Margaret, and this person here is somebody that you might know already in fact you should know already but you don't know if you'll guess who it is um see if you can guess who it is with the person next to you maybe maybe the teacher can pause it and just show you the tin lid and just have a think about who you think this person might be uh, because you might be surprised and i'll tell you what teacher if you want to pause it you're quite welcome again but i'm going to give you the answer in five seconds here we go again Are you ready four three two one this is our queen so this is Princess Elizabeth here, but she's Queen Elizabeth now. Can you believe that? She's only a young girl there. By the end of the war, she was 18. So you can see there's a big difference there. But in those days, people didn't throw things like this away. Imagine nowadays, you know, people get new phones every sort of year and things like this. But in those days, uh, they kept things and they looked after them. So this is, you know, when it was a young family, but by the end of the war uh, had, uh, had come, the Queen, Princess Elizabeth, was 18 years old. It's a big difference. So this tin has been kept for a few years. Um, right, let's have a look what's inside it. So I've put some things in here that again give us more information about the character you've created for the mum. And I say character, but really, there was genuine people who did this all the time, just like mum in our family. Um, and that is a shell dressing because as well as being an air raid warden who was a fire guard mum here she would have definitely had to rescue people from buildings if there was a, a bombed building or something like that now shell dressing it's quite simple what it means shell means bomb and dressing means bandage so it's a bomb bandage now i'm not going to open this here i'm going to let you do it yourself because i think it's interesting to just reveal some things without me sort of explaining it so you can explore yourself but all i'm saying is you'd be surprised how big it is it really is quite a big bandage uh, so I'm going to leave that there for you. Now we've also got these as well on the back of here. We've got this. Now these are instructions on how to bandage yourself in a, in a war situation. These aren't old bandages, these are just modern ones. But these are called triangular bandages. And the thing about a triangular bandage, let me just show you, is that it's got two equal sides, which is called... See if you can guess what type of triangle that is with two equal sides and a right angle. I'll let you maybe do sort that out with the teacher see if you can guess that um, and it's half a square as you can see there's the right angle a bit i'm tapping there it's half a square so when you fold it like this 
you can actually make a smaller version of itself and again and again so that means it's adapted for different sizes of people you can make it for small people or you can make it for big people like me so you can put all sorts of different bandages on now this is a copy from a world war ii book that i got from a um a first aid book um a first aid sorry box that had a little tiny book inside it and all it gave you was this and then a little paragraph of information um, i've not put that on there because i want to give you a real challenge what i want you to do is to try and work these out these three bandages out yourself can you get them to look exactly like this in the same way that a world war ii person would have done um, once you've done it you'll notice they're quite easy let's see who can become the expert in your class at first aid now teachers if you if you want to do this with a whole class these bandages they're just normal triangular bandages you can get them from most places they're quite cheap really uh, or you can just work in a small group and just have a go at that we've only got room for two unfortunately okay i'm going to fasten that later because it's quite squished up that one um, okay um so that's everything on this side um let's go over to here now now you might have had your eyes on this all the way through now this is a task i am going to do a separate video on this this is a task using our morse code machine i'm going to give you a little tiny go now we don't actually put batteries in teachers i'll just let you know that now because our people who deliver it to schools aren't allowed to carry batteries so you will have to put your own batteries in but basically this is how it works really really simple and um, you just connect it up there's the buzzer of course there's if you're doing electric circuits in class it's really interesting you've got a power source comes all the way through here this is almost like a switch well it is a switch really this comes down excuse me back to the buzzer there and then you can send different messages so if you're sending the letter a for example it's this a short sound which is a dit and a long sound which is a da so put them together is get the idea that's another task, like I say, that's a whole class task, and I'm sure your teacher will do that with you and show you how to do it. Or maybe in a small group you could do it. There's lots of cards available, teachers, and I do intend to do an extra video explaining all that. So that's Morse code. That would have been used by the dad in our family who uh, might have been learning that as part of his home guard work. It was a way to signal across long distances using either radio or wire about what was happening. It was also in the war coded as well. So uh, there is a coded task version. You might want to do that. You can have a look at that if you fancy it. So we're going to the dad or the mum. And I put this in the middle here because this could belong to both of them. I didn't really want to put it with the mum stuff. And this is a genuine World War II Civil Defence Medal. Now, you only got this if you was in the home, home guard, an air raid warden, or one of the ambulance drivers, anybody involved in looking after the people in the war. Okay, so have a look at that one. It's really nice, a Civil Defence Medal. Okay. Uh, this belongs to the dad. Uh, and this is a home guard badge. You might need a, a magnifying glass to get down and have a little look at it. But this is a home guard badge from one of the regiments of the home guard. So basically like very similar to a proper army regiment, except um, they were quite often just, well, all the time actually, they were just people who weren't in the real army. They had jobs in the daytime. Imagine doing that at night. Imagine being an air raid warden or in the home guard, working all day, like you working all day in school today, and then having to do that all night. Imagine how tired you would be okay i'm going to move these out of the way now because i've got the last thing in our box today and that's our little evacuee suitcase so the suitcase here is based on uh, children the evacuees the mum the boy and girl in this story because in my story and you'll be able to read about this i've done full profiles all about the biographies of these people and like i say you can add to that if you like or you can make up your own maybe but the ones i came up with is the, the story that the two boys, the boy and girl, have been evacuated to a place called North Wales because I based it on really very much on my family from a place called Salford near Manchester. Uh, all my family lived near the docks in the war so it was quite dangerous when the Germans were trying to bomb it and I've got a big family history connected with that. Um, so that was the story behind these two. Let's just explore. And it, again, if you wanted to look at this yourselves in a small group, uh, teachers, like I say, I've got those guided reading cards. If you wanted to look at that and explore the box yourself, you can do. Uh, and here's the pictures so these are the same ones these are the original ones uh, but these are the pictures that i've put in here and again you can make up stories about this family if you want try and find out more about them and the clothes they're wearing and things like this now we've got the only thing in the whole box which is a replica which is this ration book here uh, ration books were used to share out food because in january 1940 the germans tried to circle our country so our country's an island of course they tried to circle the country and basically starve us out their, their ideas was if they sent their submarines around 
to shoot down all the ships, to sink all the ships, the merchant navy ships that carried all the food and the petrol and the clothing and things like this, then we would be sort of starved into submission. Thankfully it never happened, but mostly because of this, these ration books, which meant no matter how much money you've got, no, no, how, much you wanted, how much money you wanted to throw at the shopkeeper if you went in and you wanted to buy everything in the shop, you couldn't because you had to have a token. So this token inside for maybe tea or eggs or something like that would be just for that week. And if you didn't have any, you couldn't have any extra. So if you've got somebody coming round and you want to bake a cake and you need 12 eggs, for example, um, you can't do that unless you saved them up for 12 weeks. But I don't know what eggs would be like after 12 weeks. But you get the idea, you've got to share the food out. This worked really well to save a lot of people's lives and stop them from starving in the war. Uh, we've got a couple of hats as well. This is the boy's cap, if you want to pass that round. Teach you if you want to pause the video and pass these round and have a little dress up session, you're quite welcome, of course. Um, we've got a girl's hat. Now I researched this quite a lot about the sort of hats that the girls wore in World War II and I didn't really have to research it to be honest. I've seen a lot of evacuee photos and a lot of them wore these. I'd say about half wore berets. It was a very popular look in World War II. So that's a girl's hat. You can have a look at that one. And finally we've got these two. These two are just two toys. We've got a genuine one and we've got a replica one here. These are, this is half and half. These are genuine boot polished tins with a replica piece of wood here is the car. Um, and uh, let's start with the teddy. So the teddy, this is a genuine one that was really evacuated in World War II. Like I say, yours might be simple, uh, it might, might be different. I have uh, got a, a few different boxes like this, like I say, with different things in. They're all the same items, but they might be slightly different. So your teddy might be slightly different, but I've made sure I've bought, I've bought all ones that were properly evacuated in World War II. So of course he would have belonged to the girl. Uh, and then we've got uh, the car which would have belonged to the boy. Now the car's a really interesting story. Um, first of all, they had a big problem with the metal in World War II. They did a lot of recycling and reusing. So they had big metal drives where basically big wagons would come around, you would give them metal and in return for sweets, they, you know, the children would give them as shrapnel or whatever they've got, including some of the toy cars or toy planes. So you might not have had a toy car or a toy plane. Here's another thing as well, the cars were made in Germany before the war. One of the big makers of toy cars were from Germany and they went over to making aircrafts. So this is my attempt to give you an idea of what it would be like to make your toy if you was in World War II. Uh, you've also got on the lid here as well, you might want to spend a bit of time looking into this. It's a list of the clothes that the children wore um, when they were evacuated. You could only basically take one set of clothes with you. Now here's an interesting thing, if you have a look at the pictures of evacuees in World War II, you find that a lot of them look really big, like they've had too much food. And the reason is, of course, that's not the reason, but the reason is um, that the mums and dads had put extra clothes on them under the coats to basically sneak extra clothes, because you're only allowed to send one set of clothes. Now imagine now, put yourself in their position that you are a mum or a dad, you've got a child going away for goodness knows how many years, two or three years, and you're only allowed to send them one set of clothes. Another way to think about it is, imagine when you go on holiday this year, only taking one set of clothes, just for a week. That's a bit weird, isn't it? Um, okay, so you can have a look at that. Um, so I think that's it really. I think that sums up everything from our World War II box from mytopicbox.co.uk. I've been Mr. B and I hope you've enjoyed watching. Thank you very much and I hope to see you again soon sometime.